Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and I have Adam here as my co-host. Happy Friday, Andy. <laughs> Happy Friday. Yeah, we're recording on a Friday and we're, we'll be uh, releasing this out Sunday night as usual. This week, we're going to start right into our ransomware protection mitigations. And we'll start with Windows 10 security. If you didn't know, there's a lot of security features already built into Windows 10. And the one that I'm going to just mention briefly is something that's included in what's called attack surface reduction or ASR. And these are certain policies that you can enable to like the name says, reduce your attack surface. The specific one that I want to mention as part of the ransomware protection is something called controlled folder access. What this does is it essentially makes it so that you control what processes run within the system folders, the common folders that most of the time are attacked by ransomware. So this feature was designed with ransomware in mind by the folks at Microsoft. And when you enable it, any type of executable that tries to run within the pre-designated folders, which are the common ones like documents, desktops, downloads, music, those system folders that are built in, those are included by default. And you can also include any other custom folders you feel like need to be included. But when you enable it, you control what processes and executables run within those. So the idea is if it's enabled and you get attacked by ransomware, that's going to start processes which will try to encrypt those folders. And since those processes are not allowed, they will automatically get blocked. I will have to say though, this feature is fairly invasive. It takes a lot of time to tune. So if it is something that you're going to enable, you're gonna wanna run it through a test group make sure that all the processes that you normally have on your workstation are included in the bypass list before you turn it on for the masses. But if ransomware is something that you're serious about, this is definitely a feature that you can enable that will for sure lock down those system folders. In a similar vein, there's another tool or technology called Known Folder Move. And the idea behind that one is taking some of those common folders you mentioned, but I'm thinking more like desktop, documents, and moving them essentially to be inside of OneDrive so that a user thinks I'm just saving a file to my desktop, but actually it's being saved to their OneDrive. Now, the benefit of this is that OneDrive being based on SharePoint has file versioning built in. So if a user has known folder move on and they're just behaving day to day on their device, even if they're saving stuff on their desktop, it's actually all getting backed up to OneDrive. And if they get hit with ransomware and if all their stuff gets encrypted, there's actually a capability inside of OneDrive for Business to just roll everything back to a previous state. So kind of built-in versioning, built-in uh, restore to help users recover their files when your protections fail and, and ransomware gets through, which you know you should plan for the possibility of that. And kind of running along with what Andy was talking about with built-in Windows 10 security, we're going to do a whole show on it down the road. So we don't really want to ruin the fun today, but there's some other tools that could potentially help as well. Something like Microsoft Defender Application Guard actually does hardware-based virtualization to isolate the Microsoft Edge browser from the rest of the OS. That way, if a user is in the Edge browser and they download a malicious file, it's going to be trapped inside that hardware-based isolation and won't be able to get the rest of the OS. And actually new in public preview recently, is the entire Microsoft Office suite. So normally there's risk there of macros and other nasty stuff that could also be a vector for ransomware, and that'll prevent those from getting out as well. So something to look at. And then uh, another technology, Microsoft Defender Application Control, is the ability to do allow-listed applications or, or uh, block-listed applications and preventing those from running if they're not on the appropriate list. So I, I know there's been other tools that have done stuff like that. Carbon Black comes to mind always, but it's actually baked right into the Windows 10 OS. And so again, we'll do a show on all of that stuff, but just something to look at as well, depending on how serious you want to get and, and kind of using all the tools in the toolbox, there's a lot there. 
Yeah, so the two that we wanted to highlight specifically for ransomware are the controlled folder access and the known folder move. And I'll put some links in the show notes for documentation on that. So if you're interested to see how it's implemented, you can look at the documentation. The next thing that we want to talk about is network segmentation. And recently, I saw a tweet from someone that was talking about old operating systems. And it was something along the lines of, if you're running Windows 7, then you're really bad at security. And I want to push back against that because there's a lot of organizations out there that are running industrial hardware, medical devices, there's embedded windows, a lot of different types of windows that are older that can't be updated because they are critical to the operations of the business. And it's not just something that you can turn off and upgrade because it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace the equipment itself, let alone the operating system that the hardware runs on. My company is a biotech company. We have a lot of lab equipment, a lot of custom built equipment that runs on PCs. And when we first got there, we asked the folks who were in charge of the lab if those machines were connected to the internet. And they said, no, these machines aren't connected to the internet because we removed the Internet Explorer icon from the operating system so that the users (laughs) can't go to the internet. (laughs) So I kind of chuckled at that and I said, well, you know, Windows is kind of a a chatty operating system. It does a lot of network talking without the user having to go to the Internet Explorer. And so the network manager there did a lot of great work in segmenting the network so that the lab equipment was completely isolated on their own VLANs within our network and they didn't have any egress out to the actual Internet. He also stood up some ACLs where only specific users could access those VLANs. And so they're programmed to specific ports within our building and the lab equipments are plugged into those specific ports. So if you plugged in your laptop into that port, you wouldn't be able to talk out to the internet. You can only talk within our intranet. You know, if networking is not your strong suit, take some time to talk to your network engineers, figure out a plan to segment the network. If you have older devices, industrial type devices, IoT devices out there. Because if it's all just one flat network, then as we have kind of stated in our previous episodes, if someone were to get access to the network, then they would have access to all your devices. Okay, but if your end user devices are still running Windows 7, then are you bad at security? Well, (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't say you're bad at security, but you definitely should pay for the extended security updates. Definitely should pay for the security updates to keep them patched. And that only goes up through 2023. The price goes up every year. The price doubles every year. Yep. So, yeah, I wouldn't say you're bad at security, but yeah, you definitely need to start looking at replacing those and upgrading to Windows 10. Yes, you should. But, you know, it's one of the things your point was really about in the scenarios where you have dedicated devices, especially devices that are paired to some sort of dedicated hardware and they have really specific OS requirements. Yeah, it makes sense that those are going to be stuck on older operating system versions. I mean, you hear stories all the time of Windows XP that's still out there. And of course, it's immediately followed by we're doing really crazy network segmentation to keep that locked down. And and even on end user devices, you know, it, it, that comes back to the discussion around security is, is a game of articulating and explaining risk and kind of looking ahead. The security team could have been screaming bloody murder, but if the team that manages the endpoints wasn't able to get the Windows 10 upgrade project done in time, that happens. So there's a cost associated with that. So anyhow, really good point around using network segmentation to kind of protect against some of the inherent risk in, in running older older systems. It's not a bulletproof method to stop ransomware, but it certainly can slow it down. Absolutely. So we're going to move on to our next big topic. These were all tools that were for defense against ransomware. And the next category is detection. And I think this is probably the hardest part because we focus so much time configuring and deploying and maintaining all those defenses. As you can see, we spent three episodes talking about defense that when it comes to detection, sometimes that just doesn't have the same attention as defense does. The mean time to detection, which is one of the metrics that is measured within information security, on average for most companies is about six months, 180 days to 200 days. Every company struggles with detecting someone on their network or detecting an attack. You have all these different tools 
and you're going to have to log into all these different consoles in order to check all the different alerts. It's important to have a place to aggregate all those signals. And so once you get all your defenses in place, the next level of detection, if you try to automate this or aggregate all the signals, is a SIM. And we're not going to dive too much into different SIM products. There's a lot of different ones out there from Splunk, Logarithm, Azure Sentinel. But what's important is, is that once you have your defenses in place, SIM is going to be your next big purchase to aggregate them, unless you want to have to check all of these different consoles and all these different alerts. And as you're getting all these alerts too, a lot of SOC analysts will go through alert fatigue and they'll see the same alerts pop up over and over again. And it's really easy to say, oh, that's a false alert or just to close them out and not investigate them because there's just too many, right? You're trying to focus on all the defenses at the same time as investigating all of these different alerts. And so sometimes you miss clues. This happened at a company that I knew of where there was an alert for impossible travel. And we talked about impossible travel before where you log in at a certain place and then within a few seconds or minutes you log in at a completely different location that is across the world and that triggers within Azure Identity as an alert for impossible travel. And most of the time they're false positives but every once in a while it could be an actual real alert and that's what this was and we missed it at the company and the attacker had access to an employee's email for a while they impersonated and sent some recon emails to the finance department and ended up tricking someone into sending some money to an office in a country that we had a presence in but it wasn't the correct office and so the company lost money because of it and it was just really hard for the security team because we saw the alert, but because it was such a common one and there were so many of them, it was very hard to sort through if it was an actual true alert. There's always the the most common information security parable is that Target had all of the breach in their SIM. They had all of the logs. They had everything there. It was all logged. There's just nothing bubbling it to the surface. And, you know, we could do a whole show on SIM easily. But the one thing I, two things I guess I would say that are really important is number one, make sure you're you're getting high fidelity alerts, alerts that have value intrinsically. And then two, make sure your SIM has the ability to do that correlation and to, to do incident creation that pulls together alerts from different systems and then shows you what it thinks are the most pertinent or most high importance at that moment. If, it, if you're just using it as a log dump, there's way cheaper ways to do it than that. If you just want to throw all your logs in a, in a bottomless pit and have them in case of a rainy day, you don't need a SIM to do that. So make sure you're getting value out of the product and it's actually helping amplify your human ingenuity by helping your SOC analysts focus their efforts on the most pressing and potentially dangerous situations. Yeah, like one of the examples is for our SIM, we were offloading our firewall logs and it would trigger each time there was some sort of alert and that would create an incident. When you analyze each one of these alerts, it basically said the action was blocked. So the firewall did its job, the threat part of the firewall did its job and it blocked the malicious traffic, but it would still create an incident. And after a while, I'm, I'm looking at all these incidents and I'm like, well, the end result was the action was blocked. So there's no need to create an incident the logs are going to be there and you can create some sort of Power BI table or chart or something like that to pull in that data to analyze the data in bulk rather than create these incidents. And from the data, you can look at the IP addresses and say, these are the majority of the IP addresses that are getting blocked and where the malicious traffic is coming from. Maybe I'll put these IP addresses into my endpoint detection and sync hold those IP addresses or those domains so that I don't even have to worry about it even coming to the firewall. So that's kind of like what Adam is talking about. You know, if the alerts or the incidents aren't generating any value, the action's already blocked, then that's just noise. And you can go back and take a look at the data later and have an action plan rather than saturate yourself with all these different alerts that won't mean anything. As we're thinking about detection, another tool that is really, really valuable and not a lot of people know about, and even less organizations have an incumbent solution in place, 
is something called Microsoft Defender for Identity. It used to be called Azure ATP, and that's really the cloud version of an on-premises tool that used to be called, and still is called, Advanced Threat Analytics, or ATA. So, okay, that was a lot of names, but what does it do? So the idea behind Microsoft Defender for Identity, and we may have mentioned this on a past show in passing, is it's a lightweight agent that you install on your domain controllers, and it analyzes all of the traffic going to and from the DCs, and then sends it up to the cloud for storage and for processing. And what it will do then is generate very, very, very high fidelity alerts about anomalous activity within your environment, your on-premises identities. So we can do simple things like look for behavior that is out of character for that user. So we could say Andy Jaw never signs in past 1 a.m. and he signed into this server at 2.30 in the morning. Also, Andy Jaw has never signed into that server before. So that might be interesting. Or the tool can look for things like reconnaissance. Andy Jaw just did a LDAP query that is really not common or or not commonly used. And then also detect ways attackers move laterally, like pass the ticket, pass the hash, golden ticket, all that good stuff. So this is a tool, a lot of organizations don't have anything comparable to it today in their environment. And it can really add a lot of value, a lot of ability to detect when somebody might be inside your network and lurking around because a lot of the things they do to do reconnaissance, to move around, to move laterally are all going to light this up and detect it. So something you might already own today with your Microsoft licensing, so certainly worth looking into. Um, It used to be called Azure ATP, but now it's Microsoft Defender for Identity. So another piece that can help lower that mean time to detection uh, would be this tool for sure. And as you're looking at detection, one of the questions to ask when you're putting your program together is, do you have a process for incident response or when you actually are under attack or have an incident happening to you right now? And I'm not going to give you all the the steps to put one together, but you know things to think about are training your tier one, tier two service desk to ask the right questions when there is an incident so that you have all the information that you need to investigate that incident the user for the machines or how many users are affected, what behavior they're seeing, screenshots of the actual alerts or of the attack, the machine names, that basic information instead of just saying, oh, this user reported some malware and then they forward the the incident over to information security and then now we have to ask all those basic questions. It just saves time because usually your tier one, there's more staffing. The SLA is usually lower so that the response time to get a technician to talk to the user or users is lower so that you can get that information faster. And this is something that you should have the mindset for because and I think we've mentioned this before, you should be prepared. You should assume breach. It's not a matter of if you're going to get attacked, but when you're going to get attacked. Having some sort of network visibility is also really important. A lot of these tools will give you an IP address or a host name and maybe not a username, or maybe they give you username. And you need to have a way to attribute all those signals together to quote unquote patient zero, the workstation that or user that caused the incident to start with. So having a way to attribute the IP address to the workstation or the workstation to the user is going to be a critical piece of your incident response. And then finally, having some sort of emergency operations center. The term EOC is used in emergency management in both civilian and military circles at the state level, federal level, where they have representatives from different departments when there is an incident so that information can be communicated and disseminated quickly and action can be taken quickly. So in the um, corporate world, your EOC should be comprised of the executive team, marketing, user experience, maybe IT infrastructure, networking, sales operations. Those are, you know, as you look across, you should have representatives from all those departments as members of the EOC or having a representative report to the EOC when there is an incident. So if there is a cyber incident and maybe legal needs to be, be involved or public affairs or HR marketing need to be involved to put out a statement because you don't want your IT analyst putting out a, a statement over social media. You want your marketing team doing that. Having that circle of communication and process in place will go a long ways when there is an incident. 
You know, when you talk about all of this, what's interesting to me is in my past life, I worked for organizations that I thought were pretty far along the IT maturity curve, very stable, very well-established organizations. And certainly they had very detailed business continuity plans and they did testing on that where there was a full recovery, but it was never done from an aspect of, we just had a cyber attack. It was always like some sort of failure, you know? And I feel like based on kind of my experience today that I talked to a lot of different organizations, this is still not a level of maturity most organizations have, where they have really sat down and mapped out, we just got attacked, we just got breached, what do we do now? They, they haven't gotten that far. They know exactly what to do to do a bare metal restore if their DC, you know, gets nuked and, and they have to rebuild it from scratch. They're really good at that, but they haven't thought through this. And so I think what you're talking about, Andy, is super important and honestly, Honestly, something that our listeners can can really take back. If you're at an organization that's got this all buttoned up, pat yourself on the back. You're ahead of the game. If you're like like most organizations and you don't really have a lot of this in place, that's okay. You have good company. But now's an opportunity where this should be every bit as detailed, every bit as operationalized as your DR plans, as your business continuity plans. And it's time to to plan for not if this happens, but when this happens, what that looks like. And it doesn't have to be super detailed. It can be a bare bones plan, but having at least a plan in place will go a long ways that when something happens, you can pull that off the shelf and say, okay, these are the steps that we put together months ago, and we're just going to run through it now because that's just a place to start, right? Because every incident is going to be a little bit different and practice that response, you know, tabletop the incident prior to anything happening, tabletop your, your response to make sure that the steps make sense, that everyone knows what to do, talk through it. I think doing an actual blind test is really difficult for a lot of organizations. I know I talked to my boss about doing a blind test where we simulate a cyber incident where our IT folks don't know what's actually happening or we don't know what's actually happening and we actually test ourselves in a quote unquote real situation. And I think if you have the luxury of having downtime to do something like that, then for sure try it out. But I think most organizations to give up a day of operations or more to test a real type scenario like that is just not doable, but at least you can tabletop your response and walk through it over a meeting in an hour, right? Andy, you said something that I had originally said it needed to be really detailed. And then you kind of came back and said, actually, if it's bare bones, that's okay. And and I kind of want to take back what I said before and agree with you <laughs> that because cyber attacks can vary so wildly in what they look like and how they play out, I would agree that more you need a framework. But there's so many good takeaways from this as far as like having that EOC in place and having those representatives named so that when you go to the the executive team and say, hey, we have an incident who's responding, they've already decided like the CFO is involved or whomever. And that's already put into place. That's that's just going to save you so much time and so much effort. And and take it from me as a guy who has been privy to too many organizations that are on the, the wrong side of this and walking in and seeing bleary eyed people and, and seeing the, the rush of activity and nobody really knowing what's going on, having any sort of framework or plan in place is going to help you tremendously. And the final big category is recovery. And Adam already kind of mentioned having a DR plan, disaster recovery plan. A lot of companies have these in place and you can definitely use this as part of a ransomware or cyber attack. Part of your DR plan should include questions like, where are you storing your data? The cloud versus data centers on-prem. Are you backing up your servers? Are they nightly backups? Are they daily backups? Are you making backups of your domain controllers? If you read through the article for the Maersk attack, every single one of their domain controllers was affected. And the only reason why they were able to stay afloat and start to recover was one physical domain controller was taken down for maintenance and it was actually offline at the time of the attack. And they used that to replicate their entire active directory after the attack. And if that was online, every one of their domain controllers would have been affected. So we mentioned this earlier, 
I talked about known folder move for Windows 10, which puts common folders like desktop and documents and, and actually puts them in OneDrive. That's something to think about when you, you think of where your user data is stored and how do users generally operate. Because if you just put OneDrive there and tell people to use it, but you're not kind of enforcing that they use it, they could have a ton of stuff in their local disk that could be lost in a ransomware attack. So again, another plug for that known folder move idea to take a look at that and use that and, and really just kind of look at overall where are your users storing their data and do you have a plan to recover that if and or when you have a ransomware attack and that goes to any type of cloud storage product you may have box dropbox google drive most enterprise cloud storage products have some sort of versioning with it the really nice part about OneDrive is one, it's included with your O365 licensing, but two, it's the only version out there that I know of that can do this known folder redirect, where if you're using a product like Dropbox or Box, if you put it within the Dropbox folder, if that's where you save everything, then great. Most of the time, they'll have versioning built in. If your contents get encrypted and get uploaded to the Dropbox, you can just roll back to a previous version. The nice part about OneDrive is, you know, if you download something, it goes into the download folder or you save something on the desktop. If that known folder redirect is active, it will automatically save that file into OneDrive. So no matter where you're saving it, it doesn't have to actually be within the quote unquote OneDrive folder. All those folders are just automatically redirecting to OneDrive. Another way to look at this is with the shift in IT service model. So in the past, we had a very high touch, very premium service kind of model where we kind of did everything for users. And, and today that's that's shifting to more of a self-service model for users. And this is one of the ways where we can incent that behavior to use cloud storage. When it, in kind of the old days, when you used to take a user's laptop and whisk it away to the bench and back everything up and then drop all of the files on their new device, there was no incentive for users to, to store their files in the right places. But when you get into a self-service model and a new device shows up and you set it up and if you stored everything in your your OneDrive or, or equivalent service, it's all going to be there. That incents that behavior. You know, that's a carrot and a stick kind of model to get users to do it. So, you know, make sure there's there's opportunities here as well as you kind of de define your IT service model and how you do hardware refresh to encourage that kind of behavior for users to store files in the right places. And one final note for recovery, there are several sites out there that have published decryption keys for ransomware that blue teamers have cracked and they're just publishing the keys for people so that if you do get encrypted by one of these types of ransomware you can download the decryption key without having to pay the ransomware so i'll put that link in the show notes so that you have it you can save it in case you know something does happen and if it is one of the strains of ransomware that has been cracked already you can see if the the decryption key will work for you i wonder how they did that yeah, that's a good question. I'm not I'm not 100% sure. You you would think I mean from a from a mathematics perspective it probably wasn't a brute force. Maybe a good guess, maybe it's from somebody who bought, paid the ransom and they gave the key out and and I'm sure these attackers are lazy and maybe reuse keys a lot. I wonder. It's just one of those things that's interesting like if you had really <laughs> if you're an attacker and you have really good key management practice for this that that would not be a reasonable thing to do if your keys are long enough and complex enough. So I, I'm wondering what's going on here that is enabling this to be even possible. The the part of my brain that gets tickled by math and, and encryption algorithms is is curious here. If you know, send us some feedback. And that's a really good segue into, you know, one of the episodes that we're gonna do later on in how to get into information security, but there are so many different facets of information security. There's just so many different areas that there's no way that everyone can be an expert. And there's a lot of smart people out there, and I'm sure one of them reverse engineered the ransomware or somehow cracked it, or maybe they, you know, got a copy of the key from somewhere. But blue teaming is just one aspect of it. And you know, there's red team, there's malware engineering, pen testers. Sales sales. Yep. So there's all sorts of different types and um, not everyone is an expert in everything. So we'll talk about that in our episode where we talk about how to get into information security, what's important, the different aspects that Adam and I know of and other opportunities that may be out there. And that's our show for the week. There's a link in the show notes to our voicemail. Feel free to leave us a voicemail or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn if there's a security topic you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on. 
Thanks and see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.